Hello, and welcome to everyone who is participating in this open plenary session of the 27th Annual Law and Religion Symposium of the International Center for Law and Religion Studies at Brigham Young University. My name is Brett Scharfs, and I'm the director of the center. For the first time in our history, we gather for this annual symposium virtually rather than in person. But we gather with grateful hearts, nonetheless, grateful that many of you who have attended the symposium in person over the last 26 years can gather electronically with us today to celebrate an important anniversary, the formal founding of the International Center for Law and Religion Studies 20 years ago. The center was officially launched on January 1st, 2000, the dawn of a new millennium, a beginning with obvious symbolic significance, as well as a date that makes it easy for us to remember how long we've been in business. Because we cannot gather in person, we are able to gather in much greater number, including so many of our friends and colleagues from around the world, some who have attended the symposium as recently as last year, as well as many for whom it has been years or even decades since we met in person. We also welcome many of you who are participating for the first time. Over the two and a half decades that we have held this symposium, we have welcomed more than 2,500 delegates. This evening, it is evening here in Utah, we welcome several multiples of that total number to this single session. So, while we are genuinely disappointed that we are not together in person, we are also genuinely grateful that we can celebrate this important milestone in a gathering with so many of you together nonetheless. The theme that we've adopted at the center this year, Field Makers, provides an opportunity to reflect on the growth of the field of international and comparative law and religion studies over the past 20 years, and also to reflect upon our efforts, individually and collectively, to contribute to this field of study. I had only been at the law school for three years when the International Center for Law and Religion Studies was founded. Care was given to the creation of our mission statement, which speaks of helping secure the blessings of freedom of religion and belief for all people in all places in three specific ways, by expanding, deepening, and disseminating knowledge and expertise, by facilitating the growth of networks of scholars, experts, and policymakers, and by contributing to law reform processes. Twenty years later, we can pause and assess our progress. At the heart of any academic center is scholarly work. From 2000 to 2020, the center and its scholars have produced 243 publications, including books, articles, and chapters. This is a rate of more than a dozen publications per year. As this audience will appreciate, this is one of the most important ways we can make a lasting contribution to the field of law and religion studies. Several of these publications deserve special mention. One of the early book projects was the desk book, Facilitating Freedom of Religion and Belief. Several years ago, Cole Durham and Bob Smith took over the most important treatise on religious organizations and the law. Another major undertaking was the four-volume Encyclopedia of Law and Religion, which includes standardized information on law and religion in nearly 200 countries, as well as articles on many international organizations relating to law and religion. Elizabeth Clark and I contributed a book on religion and law in the USA to a book series that includes similar books on approximately 20 other countries. This is an important resource for scholars of law and religion because each book is built around a common table of contents, facilitating comparative scholarship. Cole Durham and I authored the first ever case book for teaching law students about law and religion from a US international and comparative law perspective. This book has become the primary global resource for teaching law students, among others, 
about the field of law and religion in a way that looks beyond national boundaries. Finally, this symposium has generated more than 20 special issues of the BYU Law Review, featuring many of the papers that have been produced at this symposium over the last 26 years. In addition to publications, the Center is well known as a convener of and a participant in conferences. This is the 27th annual Law and Religion Symposium held at BYU Law School. We believe this has become the premier global recurring annual international conference on law and religion. But the symposium is only one of many conferences and events that the center organizes or participates in each year. In the past 20 years, the center has participated in nearly 800 conferences in nearly 90 countries. That is an average of 40 conferences per year. We have also participated in organizing and supporting regular annual regional conferences in eight to 10 areas of the world annually. If you stop and think about it, this is remarkable. For our small center to be participating in an average of 40 conferences per year, many where we have an important organizational role all over the world. This year, as we hit the pause button, on international and even domestic travel, we have participated in a remarkable 14-week series of online webinars examining the coronavirus crisis from a global perspective. For the past two years, we have been delighted as the in-person attendance at the Religious Freedom Annual Review surpassed 500 people. This year, while we weren't able to gather in person, we reached an audience of more than 100,000 people an increase not of double or even 20 times as many people, but 200 times as many people. I would be remiss if I didn't say a word about our teaching programs. This semester, I'm teaching our usual offering of two law and religion seminars at BYU Law School. Our students and our teaching are among our highest priorities. As we have for more than 20 years, Professor Durham and I also taught an online version of our courses on freedom of religion at Central European University. The center has also helped organize certificate training programs on religion and the rule of law. These programs each last from one to three weeks and provide participants with a comprehensive introduction to law and religion from a comparative and international law perspective, typically with professors participating from five to 10 countries in each program. We have also instituted a program for global scholars at Oxford University, held for three weeks each summer, helping young professors learn how to teach a global course on law and religion, and including intensive writing tutorials to help them become published English language scholars. The crown jewel of everything we do is our students. Each year, we have a group of approximately 15 summer research fellows who typically spend half of the summer after their first year of law school on an international externship and the other half working at the center. This year, we had an extraordinary group of 16 students, many of whom completed their international externship electronically. Over the years, we have had 243 research fellows as well as 598 students who have worked on the symposium's executive committee, as well as thousands of volunteers who have helped host the symposium. Perhaps our greatest regret in not being able to gather in person this year is that you who are participating with us online will not have an opportunity to meet these students. Our communications team has put together a video commemorating the 20th anniversary of the center. We would like to share it with you now with heartfelt thanks to the many friends and colleagues around the world who have contributed to this tribute. I got to know the center when I was nominated as a delegate to add to the symposium, the annual symposium, that was the 21st uh, symposium. And 
it was truly an eye opener because I had never seen uh, such a center devoted to pretty simple, if you like, uh, area of law, but I've learned now that it's the most fundamental area of law. Uh, and since that time, uh, it was it was like a, the experience was something similar to that of Paul on his way to Damascus. It was so very powerful. And so uh, that center is uh, one of the, the, I call it the mecca of law and religion in the world. I've been associated with the center in Brigham Young University for the best part of 20 years. Uh, and even before my first involvement, I was well aware of its uh, reputation. There are very few centers uh, in the world which put freedom of religion in the forefront of their uh, activities. And there are very few who do it in an entirely neutral way, promoting freedom of, it, of religion for everybody, uh, rather than in pursuit of one particular cause or one particular uh, denomination. Today, but not only today, in the last few years, uh, the center has become um, the most important uh, institution all over the world, I'd say, in the field of uh, freedom of religion or belief. And uh, um, really, um, it has been a privilege to be involved in um, uh, the center's um, activities. Religious freedom uh, is essential for the proper functioning of societies, and uh, the center has done such a tremendous job uh, focusing not just on religious freedom for um, uh, Latter-day Saints, but religious freedom for all, including people uh, of no particular faith. And, and that's really the key to um, the center's success, I would say, is that it's become a place where people like me, I'm Catholic, I find there uh, at the center like-hearted people, uh, and they've collected people from every faith and belief, including those that uh, don't have a religious, particular religious belief, into a, a global community and uh, the center the center is one of a kind no, no other place has done this and, and i'm i'm so uh, thankful and blessed to be part of it it's been my pleasure to be a senior fellow for the last several years and to be engaged in a variety of activities related to religious freedom and thought and belief i appreciate the center's approach to religious freedom and belief because they believe in that freedom for everyone, independent of whether or not uh, we agree with the faith it, or their belief, it doesn't matter. We each have the right to be able to choose that for ourselves and the opportunity to be able to change our mind when we hear something else or discover something else that comes into our lives. I think that the, the, the center is unique in the world also because it has a, a, an impact uh, at the global level. And uh, I think it also acts at the very forefront of the academic world and educational world. But uh, also it, um, it acts at the level of states and government. And uh, it uh, acts in practice. And not only has uh, the center a uh, very uh, imaginative approach towards uh, religious freedom and, uh, and, and new plans and ideas, but it also has the skill and the determination to carry it out. And uh, I think that is very rare in the academic world that you both have the ideas, but also um, uh, the skill and opportunity to really make a real difference. And I, I, I really admire that. I think the center is important because its program enables people, religious readers, experts who has different faith from all over the world to meet, discuss, disseminate, and share their knowledge and experiences in developing religious freedom to make the world a better place. Uh, and you are seeing a lot of the debate that takes place being very 
hostile, uh, partisan, involving a lot of talking to people who agree with you and not much talking to people who disagree. One of the things I've always admired about the mission of the centre is it brings together a broad group of people and it tries to engage in respectful, thoughtful conversations where people who might disagree listen to each other and try and see where they might be able to find some common ground. Uh, and there are just painfully few institutions who are doing that in the area of religious freedom. So I think the mission of the centre today is as important as it's ever been. The model that the centre brings, which is first of all collaboration, and I think that's essential, the idea that people are talking to each other, not at each other. It's incredibly important. And the center brings that into all of these environments. The center never imposes itself. The center essentially integrates with people within the local communities and listens and learns and, and builds religious freedom dialogues without any judgment. With the center, it's always about the, the, the mission of protecting religious freedom and building bridges and protecting religious freedom without causing harm to others. Most of us from various cultural, religious, ethnic, uh, national backgrounds are feeling that this center is the place in United States and in the world for promoting religious freedom. And center from Utah, from Pro, BYU, Law Religious Center is actually at the forefront of fighting for religious freedom in the world. And I'm sure even non-religious academics, but who are aware that religion is important social phenomena, are aware that this center is doing great things for promoting not just freedom of religion, but also human rights in general. The International Center for Law and Religious Studies has been just a pivotal part of the human rights movement for religious freedom. And in my lifetime, I mean, I've been involved in the space for 20 years. so. So in the space of having advocated for human rights in my, in my lifetime, it's really been at the epicenter of what academically we're able to look to for the standards of human rights and religious freedom. I think that another thing that's been interesting to me is in my work in Iraq uh, and in a number of other countries, there have been leaders that I've found that I'm able to connect to the center. And whenever they go to the ICLARS events, in, in particular the symposium in, in October, in the fall, I mean, the welcome that they get here is so enormous, and they're able to really feel connected to something very positive for religious freedom, whereas usually in their countries, it's always demonized as a negative human right. And so I think that the center has been really pivotal in presenting religious freedom as a positive human right and something that countries can embrace. Firstly, the Center for International Law and Religious Freedom, uh, I celebrated it when I came over with a colleague from the Amar Foundation uh, in January of this year. We were discussing the next phase of the Windsor Dialogue, which is our global effort together with the Centre on pursuing uh, religious persecution and its impact on police migration. That was a very happy and very fulfilling uh, couple of days. Thank you so much, everyone in the Centre, and Cole particularly. Well, I think the Centre has done just incredible, groundbreaking work in um, bringing religious freedom um, sort of out of the stacks, out of the, like bookshelves and the academy and the ivory tower and more into our public discussion, our public life. So for that, you know, I'm deeply grateful for the work that Cole and Brett and Elizabeth Clark and really a whole series of folks, Don Luther, have been doing for years and years, long before me, before I came on the scene. So I think the center has put us in a position um, where we can be, you know, the, the folks that affiliate with the center can become agents for good, not just in the United States, but in the world. I have not seen any center all over the world uh, that has practically supported religious liberty issues in terms of scholarship, capacity building uh, for, you know, capacity building workshops, training all over the world, like the Center for Law Religious Studies. I had a dream. If we can uh, establish a Center for Law and Religion similar to what BYU is doing. We have many of the centers, but practically, from the reality on ground, it seems to me that the center at BYU, Center for Law Reading, is the most active, is the most supportive, and the most serious about religious liberty. So I think they are the best people to contact with, 
to collaborate with, to associate with, and to identify with. So my VC said, granted. The center is an unsurpassed point of reference for international people all over the world where religious freedom will be defended. Whatever happens, even if flavor in society becomes different, even if people prefer other things to religion, there will be always one place in the world where religious freedom will be at the heart of every concern. That's the center, that's his strength, its strength and its charm. Our conference theme this year, Religious Freedom, Rights and Responsibilities, has been chosen intentionally at a time when we are mindful of the extraordinary challenges relating to the global coronavirus pandemic that we are facing. At a time of physical distancing, we are mindful of the importance of social connection. At a time when we worry about our rights, including rights relating to religious freedom, we are mindful of the duties that accompany those rights, as well as the responsibilities we owe to each other. This evening, we will hear from a distinguished group of keynote speakers. Tomorrow, we will have a plenary session where we will pay tribute to the center's founding director, Cole Durham, and the role he has played as a field maker in global law and religion studies. That plenary session will be followed by two breakout sessions hosted on Zoom that will have a regional focus. On Tuesday, we will have a final plenary session focusing on the contributions that religious communities are making in response to the global coronavirus pandemic. That plenary session will also be followed by two breakout sessions, again on Zoom, that will also have a regional focus. Our hope is that you will join us for as much of the online symposium as your circumstances and time permit. And our hope is that we will be seeing many of you in the coming year at events in your countries or here at our next annual symposium as we begin the next 20 years of our work together. Again, welcome and heartfelt thanks for gathering with us, especially under such extraordinary circumstances. It's my pleasure to introduce President Henry B. Eyring. Thank you, President Eyring, for joining us to commemorate the 20th anniversary of the founding of the International Center for Law and Religion Studies. President Eyring was sustained and set apart as second counselor in the first presidency of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints on Sunday, January 14, 2018. Prior to this, he served as a counselor to President Thomas S. Monson from 2008 to 2018, and to President Gordon B. Hinckley from 2007 to 2008. He was sustained as a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles in April 1995. He has served as a general authority since April 1985. President Irene previously served as the first counselor in the presiding bishopric from 1985 to 1992 and as Church Commissioner of Education twice, from 1980 to 1985 and from 1992 to 2005. President Eyring was president of Ricks College in Rexburg, Idaho, from 1971 to 1977. Before that, he was on the graduate faculty at the Graduate School of Business at Stanford University from 1962 to 1971. He holds a B.S. degree in physics from the University of Utah and a Master of Business Administration and a Doctor of Business Administration from Harvard University. Born in Princeton, New Jersey in 1933, he has served the church as regional representative, a member of the General Sunday School Board, and a bishop. President Eyring is married to the former Kathleen Johnson, and they are the parents of four sons and two daughters. President Eyring. On behalf of the First Presidency of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, I extend a warm welcome to all who are participating by virtual technology in the 27th Annual International Law and Religion Symposium 
sponsored by the International Center for Law and Religious Studies at BYU. This symposium is the world's premier conference where religious leaders, leading scholars, and government authorities come together to discuss global religious freedom issues. Deeper appreciation and understanding of the values of religious freedom for the peoples of the world will be the fruits of this symposium. This year's topic, Religious Freedom, Rights and Responsibilities, reflects well our faith's beliefs in the importance of both religious freedom and responsibility to respect the rights and needs of everyone. Freedom of religion and conscience and the right to public worship are essential elements of our faith. We have a deep commitment to the brotherhood and sisterhood of all and feel an obligation as followers of Jesus Christ to serve and bless those in all countries, regardless of their religious affiliation or lack thereof. In the spirit of our master, who went about doing good, we seek to help lift the burdens of those in need in any faith throughout the world. We pray that the peoples of the world will be united in solving the health and economic challenges wrought by the COVID-19 pandemic, and in so doing, mourn with those that mourn and comfort those who stand in need of comfort. We also hope that ways to minister and third, serve those who have great needs will be found. President Russell M. Nelson, the president of our church has said, we pray for those who are suffering and for those who have lost loved ones. The church, through its humanitarian organization, Latter-day Saint Charities, is actively engaged throughout the world in alleviating suffering resulting from the pandemic. We are currently involved in over 750 pandemic related relief projects in 141 countries and are grateful for wonderful partners and opportunities to serve. We support the efforts of governments and medical and public health leaders to make wise decisions about how best to address the spread and impact of COVID-19. Our church is committed to obey honor and sustain the laws and regulations adopted to control the pandemic. At the same time, we encourage government leaders not to unnecessarily restrict the rights of believers to engage in public worship. With effort and prayer, we believe that governments can effectively balance the priorities of faith and public health. We are grateful to each of you for your commitment to promote and protect religious freedom and your, for your individual and collective efforts to assist those who have the greatest needs because of this pandemic. Thank you for the purity and goodness of your hearts. I pray that this symposium will be successful in the discussion of religious freedom. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Bonnie Dougal is the principal representative of the Baha'i International Community to the UN. As part of the community of international NGOs at the UN since 1994, she's currently serving on the steering committee of the NGO Working Group on the Security Council. She has served as president of the NGO Committee on Freedom of Religion or Belief, as co-facilitator of the NGO Working Group on UN Access, co-facilitators of the GEAR Campaign, Stat Committee on the Status of Women, and chair of the Global Forum of the NGO Committee on UNICEF, as well as other groups. Ms. Dougal holds a master's degree from environmental law from Pace University School of Law in New York, 
and a law degree LLB from the University of Delhi in India. She's authored public, published articles, statements, and papers. Prior to relocating in the U.S. in 1988, she practiced law before the Supreme Court of India. I'd like to thank the Center of Law and Religion at Brigham Young University for this invitation to speak to you today. Over 70 years ago, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights boldly proclaimed the inherent dignity and the equal rights of all members of the human family. Guided by the vision of equality for all, the Declaration enshrined the fundamental right of every human being to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. Article 18 explicitly affirms that everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. This right includes the freedom to change his religion or belief, and freedom either alone or in community with others, and in public or private, to manifest his religion or belief in teaching, practice, worship, and observance. Taking this recognition further, the United Nations has increasingly acknowledged over the years the important links between religion, freedom, and human development. The 1995 World Summit for Social Development noted that societies must respond more effectively to the material and spiritual needs of individuals, and that tolerance and religion and religious hatred pose severe threats to human security and well being. In 2004, the United Nations Human Development Report for the first time acknowledged cultural liberty as a vital part of human development and affirmed the profound importance of religion to people's identities. In an equally significant contribution, the 2004 Arab Human Development Report identified freedom as both the guarantor and the goal of human development and the primary requisite for development in the Arab region. Yet, despite the international community's unanimous adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and its codification in subsequent instruments of international law, the world bears witness to persistent intolerance and discrimination based on religion or belief. The proliferation of violence in the name of religion the manipulation of religion in the interest of political ideology, and increasing tensions between religion and state policies. Many of the world's population still lives under laws which restrict the right to freely adopt and change one's religion or beliefs. Moreover, restrictions of religious freedom have been linked to diminished well-being in the general population increased social conflict, poor socioeconomic outcomes, and political instability. The rising tide of religious extre extremism has fueled these developments, threatening security, human development, and efforts towards peace. Given the interdependence of human rights, violations of freedom of religion or belief have compromised, among others, the right to education, employment, peaceful assembly, citizenship, political participation, health, and at times, life itself. Indeed, the promise of freedom of religion or belief for all remains one of the most contested and pressing human rights of our times. Notwithstanding extremist abuses of power in the name of religion, True religion allows individuals and communities to reach the roots of human motivation, to lift one's vision beyond purely material conceptions of reality, and to embrace higher notions of justice, reconciliation, love, and selflessness in the service of the common good. 
Indeed, religious and cultural norms have proven to be powerful determinants of attitudes and behaviors. And with the many challenges facing humanity, the world stands more and more in need of the hope and the strength of spirit that faith imparts. Therefore, it is essential that the right to hold a belief be protected. Freedom of religion understood as freedom to investigate the full range of human existence stands not just as a right, but also as a means to explore, understand more fully, and actively address the many challenges and opportunities facing humanity today. The freedom to hold beliefs of one's choosing and to change them is therefore central to human de development, as it makes possible the individual's search for meaning, a distinguishing impulse of the human conscious, conscience. The human being is not only an economic and social creature, but also a noble one with a free will and a conscience that make possible the search for meaning and for truth. Without the freedom to pursue this fundamentally human quest, neither dignity nor justice is possible. Aspects of responsibilities in relation to freedom of religion or belief relate to both aspects of freedom to have, adopt, and change religion or belief, as well as to manifest religion or belief. The affirmation of the interrelatedness of development, security, and human rights, and fundamental freedoms sets the stage for an earnest re-examination of the role of freedom of thought, conscience, and religion in the pursuit of a peaceful, prosperous, and just society. As a worldwide religious community which regards the human conscience as sacred and upholds the individual's independent search for truth, the Baha'i international community has long urged the United Nations and the international community to give serious consideration to four critical yet neglected issues related to the right to freedom of religion or belief. The first one is the right to change one's religion or beliefs. The second, to share the right to share one's beliefs with others. Third, the responsibilities of the international community and national governments vis-a-vis -vis marginalized and peacefully organized religious communities. And fourth, the responsibilities of religious leaders vis-a-vis -vis the promotion and protection of the right to freedom of religion or belief. In the short time that I have today, I will give greater attention to the third and fourth of the points on the question of responsibilities. Though the question of responsibilities gets short shrift in the human rights community when it comes to discussion of responsibilities other than those of states, responsibilities are not alien to the canon of international human rights. Article 29 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights states, one, everyone has duties to the community in which alone the free and full development of his personality is possible. Two, in the exercise of his rights and freedoms, everyone shall be subject only to such limitations as are determined by law solely for the purpose of securing true due recognition and respect for the rights and freedoms of others and of meeting the just requirements of morality, public order, and the general welfare in a democratic society. These rights and freedoms may in no case be exercised contrary to the purposes and principles of the United Nations. The hard work lies beyond putting words on a page. It comes through genuine and concerted effort to realize such commitments. 
states must be the standard bearers in upholding and fulfilling the realization of human rights. Beyond the state, every individual has a role to play within their own sphere of influence to translate ideals into reality. Indeed, the peoples of the world are galvanized by the same vision that the governments have committed themselves to. As members belonging to the same human family, whatever our beliefs and backgrounds, we are all protagonists who have a responsibility to work for the betterment of our communities. Everyone has an essential role to play in implementing fundamental human rights. When individuals assume responsibility for ensuring each other's human rights, the foundation for unity will be firmly established. The responsibility to uphold universal principles of freedom of religion or belief also rests with religious leaders. In a world that is harassed by violence and conflict in the name of religion, relig leaders of religious communities bear tremendous responsibility for guiding their followers towards a peaceful coexistence and mutual understanding with those who think and believe differently. Given the weight of culture and religion in shaping motivation and behavior, it is clear that legal mechanisms alone will not engender the commitment and mutual understanding required to sustain a culture of peaceful coexistence. The role of religious leaders as partners in word and deed in the creation of a culture of respect for human dignity and freedom of conscience, religion, or belief cannot be overstated. Religious leaders must uphold the sacred nature of the human conscience and unreservedly accord each individual the freedom to search for truth. Fostering unity by harmonizing disparate elements and nurturing in every heart a selfless love for humankind is the task of religion. Great possibilities to cultivate fellowship and concord are therefore open to religious leaders. The responsibility of all actors then is to foster such fellowship where individuals and communities can live together with dignity and respect and are free to shape their present and their future. This requires concerted action to nurture an understanding and appreciation for humanity's inherent interconnectedness and oneness. Without a vision of shared identity and common purpose, we fall into competing ideologies and power struggles. The bedrock of a strategy that can engage the world's population in assuming pop responsibility for its collective destiny must then be the consciousness of the oneness of humankind. That human consciousness necessarily operates through an infinite diversity of individual minds, beliefs, and motivations and detracts in no way from its essential unity. It is in fact through a diversity of viewpoints and indeed beliefs that higher degrees of truth can be sought. The Baha'i International Community submitted its view on this matter in 1947, a view it developed in Terelia in 1993. And it said, it's impossible to implement human rights without a sense of collective responsibility. Indeed, if the whole of humanity is one interconnected body, then an injury to any member is an injury to the body as a whole. In the Baha'i perspective, the concept of responsibility in the context of human rights encompasses the responsibility devolving upon every person to recognize the essential oneness of the human race. Everyone has an essential role to play in implementing fundamental human rights. When individuals assume responsibility for ensuring each other's human rights, 
the foundation for unity will be firmly established. This does not say that states do not have the responsibility, and I didn't mean to imply that, but on, as a whole, every individual needs to step up when protecting freedom of religion and belief. The ideas shared here are pertinent to this in that we need to adopt and promote a sense of collective responsibility towards the freedom of religion or belief of one and all, regardless of whether they hold our religion or belief or another. In order for the standard of human rights, now in the process of formulation by the community of nations to be promoted and established as prevailing international norms, a fundamental redefinition of human relationships is called for. Our manner should be such that we consider ourselves as being part of one interconnected body, recognizing that an injury to any member is an injury to the body as a whole. The abandonment of prejudices cannot be rooted out by contest and conflict. It must be supplanted by the establishment of just relationships among individuals, communities, and institutions of society that will uplift all and will not designate anyone as the other. The change required is not merely social and economic, but above all, moral and spiritual. This is only possible through the recognition of our oneness and our shared identity. Our freedom of religion or belief responsibility applies across human rights and devolves on each and every one of us as part of our recognition of the essential oneness of the human race. As a representative of the Baha'i faith, I could provide all too many examples of what it means at a personal level to have freedoms denied on the basis of religion. My co-religionists in Iran and Yemen can testify to this. But what may be more important is how to active, is how active exploration of one's higher nature and that of humanity as a whole allows one to respond in ways that are constructive and productive, regardless of circumstances. This is the way we can all move forward. Thank you. Our other keynote speaker is Professor Aza Karam, who is the Secretary General of Religions for Peace and Professor of Religion and Development at the Freie Universität in Amsterdam. Religions for Peace, the organization she is Secretary General of has facilitated multi-religious engagement at global, regional, and national levels for 50 years. Professor Karam has served as a senior advisor on culture at the United Nations Population Fund since 2007, as a coordinator and chair of the United Nations Interagency Task Force on Religion and Development, where she coordinated engagement with members of a global interfaith network for population development with over 600 faith-based organizations from all regions of the world, representing all religions and interreligious affiliations. Did tremendous work there. She was the lead facilitator for the UN's strategic learning exchanges on religion development and diplomacy, and has served as president of the Committee of Religious NGOs at the United Nations that has supported the founding of numerous interreligious networks. Her PhD focused on political Islam and became her first book in Arabic, her mother tongue, and in English. She has since published widely in several languages on international political dynamics, including democratization, human rights, peace and security, gender, religious engagement, and sustainable development. She was born in Egypt and now lives in the United States. Greetings of peace to one and all. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be able to address you today and to be in your August company, addressing a very, very important theme, which is religious freedom and religious responsibilities. I am so sorry that I could not be with you in person as the event was going live, because I know that all the BYU events that I've had the distinct honor and pleasure to be part of have been some of the most informing and catalytic actually to myself and to the way that I think and much of what I do. 
So I'm missing out on not being able to be with you and to exchange with you, but I'm delighted to have this opportunity to share very honestly, not politically correctly, but really just very honestly, some thoughts on the very critical theme of religious freedoms and religious responsibilities that you are tackling today. The theme is very close to my heart. Why? Because I have spent so much of my life trying to uphold the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and human rights as a, as a set of principles that are actually predicated upon all different faith traditions. To me, my understanding of human rights is that it is the best of all that is shared between all of the faiths that are out there. In other words, as the divine has sought to communicate with us and to educate us, the best of what the divine has sent and shared and that is shared between us is what constitutes human rights. Yes, it's a secular document that is composed by man, men with a few women, but in truth, it is truly built and predicated on that which is shared between all faith traditions, the best values shared. And if religions had not existed before the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, I think the attempt to find that which holds us all decent and dignified, we would have tried to create those religions anyway. So we're beyond that stage, we're in this space. Spending so many years of my life upholding the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, its relevance, its validity, its importance, etc., has made me realize that we often misunderstand the human rights as though they are rights without subsequent obligations and responsibilities. Now, the truth of the matter is that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, per se, has all the rights and responsibilities because you can't speak to what you are entitled to as a human being without indicating what has to be done. There's no point in setting out a set of entitlements if it's not clear precisely how that would be achieved. But never mind, the misperception in my part of the world, the Muslim world in particular, but also I have found here in many parts of this non-Muslim world, is that human rights doesn't take into account the responsibilities, which wouldn't make sense, but hey, misinterpretations and misperceptions rarely ever make sense, quite frankly. But the issue at hand here that I want to share with you, and I speak, if you'll allow me, as a scholar of religion and development and diplomacy. I am a professor in that capacity, and it is with that hat that I would like to share a few thoughts with you today about rights and responsibilities, and especially religious freedoms. Because I cannot speak as the Secretary General of Religions for Peace. Religions for Peace is the United Nations of all of the world's religious institutions, and religious communities. Every single religious institution and religious community with an infrastructure of leadership is a member of Religions for Peace. When I worked for the UN for two decades, I used to always say when I spoke, I cannot speak for the United Nations system. It is well nigh impossible. I was not given that formal role. But I find, perhaps ironically, that even in Religions for Peace, as a servant, to that august body of religious institutions and communities from around the world that I obviously cannot speak for all of them either. Each of these religions has its own intact, intricate, complex, complicated institutions and language. They come together in religions for peace amazingly. I'm humbled by it every minute of every day. All these religious institutions come together to serve the cause of peace and peace understood as health, social, economic, political welfare, cultural significance, dignity. In December, the August members, religious institutions came together and decided on six strategic priorities for the movement of religions for peace. And it is a movement. It is by no means an organization. It's a movement. 90 interreligious councils, national interreligious councils, and six regional interreligious councils. Each council has on it, in it, 
the representation of the religious institutions and communities of that particular nation. I cannot speak for all of this, especially because they are also independent entities. They are affiliated to religious cities, but each council is an independent entity. When they came together in December of 2019, one of the top priorities that they actually all agreed to do together because it's always about what they're going to do together. Each one of them is doing remarkable, amazing work, as well you know, in your own community, in your own organization, representing your own esteemed religion. Plenty structures doing plenty, plenty much. But what they agreed to do together as a strategic priority is deeply significant. Because number one on that list is to serve as champions of freedom of thought, belief, and conscience. Let me say that again. The world's religious institutions, their representatives, came together to agree on some strategic priorities for them to do together for the next five years, God willing. Priority number one is to serve as champions of freedom of thought, conscience, and belief. Why do I keep saying freedom of thought, conscience, and belief? Many of you who know, and I wish I was there to see you, Many of you will know that that is precisely Article 18 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It does not speak only of freedom of religion. It speaks of the freedom of thought, conscience, and belief. Why? Because there is no way that I can live and get my dignity to practice my faith, whatever it is, in whichever context, if my ability to own freely and exercise freely my own thought, my sense of consciousness, if both of these are not mine to have to exercise the freedom of thought and the freedom of conscience, then quite frankly, it is, I said I wasn't going to be politically correct. It is silly to expect me to be able to exercise my freedom of belief. For what is belief if it is not intimately connected to how I think and how you think, to what my conscience tells me and what your conscience upholds? What is freedom of belief if it is my religion at the expense of everybody else's without regard to how others think, of what conscience dictates to others? What is my freedom of belief if I do not take into account the very systems of informing our spiritual, emotional, physical, mental, cultural well-being. What belief is it that is intact and detached from thought and conscience? What belief is that? And how can I possibly demand the right to the freedom of my belief and not really care too much about the freedom of thought and conscience that are intimately connected to my belief. And how dare I think that I could possibly live in a society arguing for the religious freedom of me or my community without actively defending and upholding the right of my neighbor, my family member, my community for freedom of thought and conscience and belief. How can I possibly expect to live dignified with my freedom of religion or belief at the expense of freedom of thought and conscience? Really, how is that? And yet it is. Unfortunately, even in our terminology, and remember words matter, they matter plenty. Many of our faith traditions came to us through the word. So words matter. And that's why freedom of thought conscience and belief refers and is and should be how we understand and how we practice, how we defend and how we champion religious freedoms. That will, per definition, if we were to be champions of freedom of thought, conscience and belief, per definition, we would not be able to stand silent when any particular regime, political, economic, social, would threaten the freedom of thought and conscience 
of my community or anybody else's. We would not be able to stand silent if indeed we judge ourselves and serve in the capacity to be those who defend and champion religious freedom, we would not be able to stand in silence as unfortunately many of us are today. Because freedom of thought and freedom of conscience is threatened globally. That means that freedom of religion and belief is threatened globally. But I will not speak only of freedom of religion and belief. I will speak of freedom of thought and conscience and belief. Because I know, as you do, that there are many countries around the world today which will uphold religious freedom and religious liberty, but will shy away from naming, let alone shaming, other countries, other governments, other regimes, which are seriously threatening the freedom of thought and the freedom of conscience of their citizens. Because as long as the religious freedom is okay, we can be quiet about the rest. It's all right. It's not all right. If I, as a Muslim, am thrown into a camp to have my thoughts cleaned, to become better educated, that is a threat to my freedom of thought. And in so doing, that is a threat to my freedom of conscience. And in so being, that is a threat to my freedom of belief. And if I am silent about what I see happening to those whose freedom of thought and conscience is threatened on a daily basis, in fact, never granted by certain regimes, if I'm silent about the threat to others' freedom of thought, freedom of conscience, and freedom of belief, I don't deserve the title of being a believer myself. And I am in no position to be able to defend the freedom of anybody, the belief of anybody. That would not be right. I would be a hypocrite. Ladies and gentlemen, I think you know what I'm talking about. And that's why I don't speak in the name of religions for peace, because it is extremely difficult to speak in the name of all the different religious communities in the world who today are facing very different kinds of challenges and for political reasons, for cultural sensitivity reasons, for economic and financial reasons, find it very difficult to point out and name the harm that is happening to members of other religious communities around the world who are being denied their freedom of thought, conscience, and belief. If we understand that the way we think, that the emotion that we have as consciousness or awareness thereof, and our beliefs are all intricately connected, then we also understand and appreciate that we cannot defend to take one piece of it in a silo and make that into our business. Freedom of thought is not a freedom that you can defend on its own. Freedom of conscience is not a freedom that you can defend on its own apart from belief and thought. No, we are one human being. And though we are different, we are all created by the same. And in that cohesive whole is who we are and what we are. Our belief requires us to have freedom of thought and conscience. Our beliefs require each one of us to champion and to defend the right of everybody else's freedom of thought and conscience and belief. Even those who have no belief, because that's their conscience, because that's their thinking, and they are entitled to it. And I am obligated to defend their right to that. And it is only when I understand deep inside my own soul in the depths of my own spirit, when I understand that I have an obligation to defend the rights of those who have no beliefs, that is when I truly understand what my religious belief is. Because nobody gave me the right to sit as judge and jury to all. But religious freedom, the responsibility 
to exercise religious freedom, the responsibility to defend religious freedoms, demands, indeed holds me accountable to myself and to my divine creator. It demands that I serve to defend the freedom of every single person around me, to their thought, to their conscience, and to their belief, because they are intimately connected. That is my personal position on this issue. One of the things I'm learning in the context of Religions for Peace is that if we genuinely believe together that when we come together as different believers, as diverse believers, there is a divine spirit that comes with us, that comes amongst us, that sits with us, that becomes part of us. Of course, of course, as a Muslim, I believe God is always there. God is part of me. I am part of the divine, of course. And by the way, as a Muslim, I have to believe in the sacred mandate all the way back to Abraham, which includes Jesus Christ and Moses and everyone else behind him and before them. But that's just beside the point, because, you know, we Muslims are often misunderstood. So let me go back to Religions for Peace and what I'm learning. I'm learning from Religions for Peace that it's extremely powerful to come together in belief. It's extremely powerful when we come together as believers, diverse believers. I feel the presence of the Spirit amongst us deeply powerfully when we come together as diverse believers. Of course I feel it when we come together as Muslims or Christians or what have you, of course. But there's something particularly magical about the ability to come together as believers. And I think that's what I would like us to be systematic and persistent about trying to defend. That we honor the divine. We honor our Lord, no matter what we call him or her. We honor the divine when we sit with one another with our different understandings, thoughts, conscience of that divine. That's when we honor the divine most. That we honor the divine who created us all, who created us all in our diversity. I wonder, would it have been so difficult for God to create us all alike? Of course not. So if God created us diverse, perhaps there was some rather deep, profound logic behind it. And that is because I believe that when we come together in our differences and when we defend the right of each one of us to believe differently, to think differently, to have a different conscience, when we do so, we honor the divine. Because that is the divine's creation, after all. That difference, that diversity is the divine's creation. So what do we do with that particular understanding? Well, for one, we must appreciate that as an institution that is working with different religious actors and religious leaders around the world, and faith leaders, including indigenous peoples, with a 50-year history, as an institution, we are committed to defending that right that holds inextricable thought, conscience, and belief, and that we cannot excise a group of rights from that, and that to take out religious freedom from that context is to orphan religious freedom. The other thing that I think is very important for us to understand and appreciate, and I have learned this through my participation in the last couple of BYU seminars, by the way, the humility that comes with appreciating the divine, the humility that comes with understanding that those around me believe very differently, may even think very differently, and certainly seem to have a different aspiration to conscience, but that that humility that is bred out of our differences, not because of our sameness, but a humility bred out of coming together to defend one another as a result of our difference, that humility is also a characteristic of the divine. Unfortunately, many of our leaders lack it, especially certain leaders in political institutions which shall not be named in many parts of the world. Humility is an absent set of feelings. And where humility is absent, I doubt, I doubt that the divine can walk with us. Because to accept the power of the divine also requires us to accept the humility vis-a-vis -vis that divine. 
And that means that I can become a truer, more complete person only when and if I take on board as my job, as my duty, as my responsibility that I must defend your right, every other person's right to be free in the way you think, in your consciousness and your understanding of it and in what you believe and all of what you believe. Our ability to respect human rights, ladies and gentlemen, is not because we, we lack faith, not because we lack respect for a sacred document or a sacred history. Our ability to respect human rights and to defend them is precisely because we believe that the divine is the common things that we all aspire to and believe in. The divine lies not in harming one another. The divine lies not in being more supreme vis-a-vis -vis one another. The divine lies not, I believe, in ignoring the pain of one another in different parts of the world. Because we are persecuted based on our religion, our belief, our thought, or our conscience. We are living the time of the 1930s. 1939, to be precise. Make no mistake, we are living in those times. Religious communities around the world today are more persecuted than ever. All and each religious community. Some are minorities here, majorities there. It doesn't matter. Religious communities are persecuted today more than ever before. This is the time to be able to speak for your brother and your sister in the other part of the world whose right to thought, whose right to conscience, whose right to belief is being actively taken away. This is the time to speak out. So good that we meet, good that we talk with one another, good that we listen, thank you for that. But ultimately, this is the time to act. Thank you. Heiner Bielefeld is a full professor of human rights and human rights politics at the University of Erlangen-Nuremberg in Germany. Before taking the newly established Chair for Human Rights, he was Director of the German Institute for Human Rights, the official accredited National Human Rights Institution of Germany. Between August 2010 and October 2016, Professor Bielefeld served as the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion and Belief. When discharging this mandate, he conducted fact-finding operations in different parts of the world and presented thematic reports to the UN General Assembly, as well as the UN Human Rights Council. Professor Bielefeld's research interests include different interdisciplinary facets of human rights theory and practice, with a particular focus on freedom of religion or belief. His most recent publication, together with Michael Weiner, on this subject is Religious Freedom Under Scrutiny, University of Pennsylvania Press 2020. Hello and a good day to everybody. I'm happy to join your conference, even though, of course, I would have preferred to be physically there, but okay, we have to somehow live uh, with the circumstances. And let me, first of all, uh, express my deep gratitude to the organizers in Brigham Young University to have brought us all together for discussing uh, this very important human right, freedom of religion or belief. My specific theme today is responsibility. I mean, that's the key word in my talk, responsibility within the work on behalf of religious freedom. I will distinguish between different layers or dimensions of responsibility, actually between three different dimensions. But um, it's a pretty unusual theme. Why? Because within the human rights movement, there seems to be some hesitancy to talk about responsibility. I mean, the reason is, in the understanding of many people, many people working and moving in human rights circles, the term responsibility sounds a little bit authoritarian. 
I mean, that I think is wrong, but it's understandable. It's understandable because, I mean, we do have that experience that certain governments like to invoke responsibility, like to invoke duties in order to render human rights, the enjoyment of human rights dependent on a prior fulfillment of citizens' duties or citizens' responsibilities. Citizens' duties as defined by those governments. I mean, and that, of course, can make the status of human rights, including religious freedom, precarious. And we, we see that in many parts of the world, so that's a reality. and may explain uh, that uh, many human rights activists remain cautious or show a certain hesitancy vis-a-vis -vis the vocabulary of responsibility. Okay, while this is understandable, I still think it's wrong. It means drawing false conclusion from a certain observation. I think what we actually need is a more precise way of addressing responsibility, addressing responsibility with diligence, precision, caution, but also with enthusiasm. So it is in this spirit that I will now distinguish three different levels with regard in particular to religious freedom, but religious freedom as a human right. So, the, I mean, the first dimension is not very much surprising. It's the legal dimension of responsibility. I mean, the international law dimension. So, and uh, everyone knows that rhetoric, and it's actually correct. Human beings are the right holders of religious freedom and other human rights. And governments, states, are the duty bearers. Okay, states fulfill the role as, as formal guarantors of human rights under international law. So, and here, I mean, the, the, the human rights we are particularly interested in, religious freedom, has been enshrined in Article 18 of the International Covenant on civil and political rights, Article 18. So, I mean, here we have a formal responsibility of states, of those states ratifying the international government to act as the guarantors of that right, as religious freedom within their jurisdiction. So it's very important to keep that dimension in mind, even though nowadays we feel we have to move beyond. One reason, uh, an obvious reason, in fact, is that, I mean, we see the crisis of multilateralism. We see the limits of what the current infrastructure of human rights uh, uh, implementation can bring about by holding governments uh, to account. So we have to move beyond. And uh, in the search uh, for, new, for, for more actors, for broadening the sphere also of legal responsibility. I mean, um, international companies are in the discussion, under discussion. Uh, some others look out for cities, human rights cities, but also religious communities and religious leaders. I come back to that in a minute. Okay, while this is important uh, to search for more actors, for broadening the sphere, of activities on, in support of religious freedom, uh, we should never forget uh, that uh, the formal guarantees rest with governments. So we cannot blur the contours of, or we should certainly not blur, undermine compromise, those formal responsibilities as they are anchored in international uh, human rights law. Pretty important. I mean, this is the first dimension, but it's not the only one. Let me now move to a second dimension, and that is moral responsibility. So moral responsibility for the protection, for the promotion of religious freedom. And here, I would say, all the right holders also are duty bearers. They are duty bearers not in the legal understanding of the word, 
but in a moral understanding of the word. So, I mean, this actually applies to all of us. We all are right holders of religious freedom, but at the same time, we have a responsibility. We are duty bearers for the promotion, for the protection of that very important human rights. And of course, uh, this is a, a responsibility which in particular affects religious communities, communities, but also religious leaders. And the good message is some religious communities actually show admirable commitment on behalf of religious freedom. Um, let me give you one example, or maybe two, maybe three. So the first example that comes to my mind, very impressive. A couple of years ago, in the plenary of the Human Rights Council, the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva, the representatives of the Baha'i community took the floor and spoke in support of Shia Muslims under persecution. Now, wait a moment, take a breath. Uh, I mean, bearing in mind what the Baha'is suffer in the Shia governed Islamic Republic of Iran, I mean, that is pretty, I mean, it's really astounding that a Shia, uh, that a Baha'i representative um, speaks out in support of Shia Muslims, minorities suffering persecutions in countries in Southeast Asia, for instance, but also in the Middle East. Uh, I mean, that is an increasing trend. But that a Baha'i representative, uh, a representative of a community that has suffered so much, really shows that strength, that commitment. Uh, it's pretty admirable. And I mean, it was one of those moments in the UN, one of those rare moments in the United Nations where you actually felt um, something going down the spine, a certain trickle going down the spine, I mean, something very specific. Then I was happy when visiting uh, communities in Indonesia to meet a Shia representative, I mean, it was a chance meeting, uh, by coincidence, a young Shia Muslim woman who spoke in support of the Baha'is, which is also pretty rare. Uh, but I mean, these things happen. And that is really uh, wonderful that religious communities do not only speak on behalf of their own people, which is also, of course, legitimate, but actually across denominational boundaries across religious bonds. I mean, that is really something I like, something I would encourage. And let me take the opportunity to also appreciate what the LDS Church is doing in this regard. I mean, I have in the last years often met with representatives also of the LDS Church and uh, people who are very committed to religious freedom worldwide and in a very broad-minded understanding and interpretation of this right. And that is really what we need. Little footnote, uh, the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights started three years ago a new platform that it might be worth looking into. It's called Faith for Rights. It's a learning platform, Faith for right, Rights, that encourages religious communities to mobilize their own strength in support of human rights in general, and again, religious freedom in particular. Okay, now I have covered two dimensions, the legal one, international law, holding states to account, I mean, ask, requesting states to operate as formal guarantors, and then the moral dimension, which is much broader, somehow including all of us as duty bearers, not only as right holders. And now let me turn to a third dimension, the last point I want to make. There's yet another layer of responsibility, which for lack of a better word, I would like to call philosophical responsibility. 
sounds a bit unusual, and I'm not myself entirely happy about that adjective, but I haven't found a better one. Philosophical responsibility. So what is it I'm, I want to say in this regard? Um, so here, the crucial point is human dignity. Human dignity. A responsibility for, it, for the awareness, for enhancing the awareness of the significance of human dignity within human rights. And I, again, I would say religious freedom gives a particularly important entry point for such activities. What is human dignity? Okay. I remember difficult discussions. I don't want to make things more complicated than necessary. So let me say only one thing. Human dignity has much to do with the exposure of human beings to demands of responsibilities. So human beings are the addressees of responsibility demands. And you can actually see that reflected in the mother document of international human rights law, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the 19. 48 Universal Declaration, Article 1. I mean, Article 1 starts with a very famous sentence. Everyone quotes this. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. Okay, I mean, that is the most famous quote of the Universal Declaration. But then it goes on. All human beings, they are endowed with reason and conscience. And that is comparatively rarely cited. Human beings endowed with reason and conscience. So human beings having the potential of responsible agency. It's a complicated theme. Actually, it can even become a slippery theme. It can be misunderstood because, I mean, what it does not say is we only give, though, uh, uh, we give dignity to those who behave in a responsible manner. I mean, that would be crazy. No, no, it's about the potential. It's about human beings being under that spell, being addressees of a demand. Or if I may use the words of my fellow German, Immanuel Kant, they are under the spell of the categorical imperative. Yeah? agency, responsible agency. And that is an agency that human beings can only share among themselves, only share among humans, responsibility. And also in our current ecological crisis, uh, while we are maybe discovering that the scope of responsibility must go beyond human interests, it's still true that we can share responsibility only among humans. So, and uh, I think that is an insight we always confirm, at least implicitly, when talking about human dignity, which is the core of human rights. It's the core also of religious freedom. So dignity is not a meritocratic concept. It's not something we give or grant in exchange for particular acts or performances. No, it's strictly egalitarian and it's fully inclusive so it also includes in particular those people with severe handicaps, with mental disabilities, cognitive disabilities, dementia, etc. Everyone should be fully included in that web of responsibility that can only exist among human beings. Now back to religious freedom. I think dealing with religious freedom offers a particular entry point for addressing that most foundational dimension of human rights, respect for human dignity. And so, I mean, here we have a responsibility for even cherishing, for cultivating the awareness of responsible agency, that this is the underlying, the underlying foundations of human rights in general. Nothing could be more foundational than respect for human dignity. So, I mean, 
I said it, it's the foundation of human rights in general, not just religious freedom. But religious freedom is the one human right that specifically tackles the issue that human beings have convictions. Human beings have responsibility. Human being, beings live or sh wish to live, should be free to live in accordance with their existential beliefs. And I think that's why, I mean, this right also gives a particularly profound entry point for that discussion, human dignity as the core of human rights in general. So with freedom of religion or belief being one example, but a very specific right, uh, closely connected with the awareness of human dignity. So that's what I wanted to say. And if I may briefly summarize, okay, I've distinguished between three levels of responsibility international law responsibility, holding governments to account, moral responsibility affecting all of us. But then within that moral responsibility, maybe another level also engaging all of us to cultivate the very awareness of responsible agency among human beings, human dignity. I mean, these three levels should not be mixed. They are specific. So we should distinguish between the legal responsibility, between the moral responsibility, and maybe within the moral responsibility also that philosophical dimension that we should, at least from time to time, bring up explicitly. I and mean, all of this is manifest in human rights commitment generally, but FORP, I think, harbors specific possibilities to encourage reflection, start debate, and raise awareness. Thank you very much, and I wish you very good and fruitful deliberations. Thank you.